Okay. Whoops. Hello, everybody. Congratulations on getting here. Uh, <laughs> getting through the, 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 the combined force of, of, of Arctic, Arctic tundra and, uh, and uh, industrial action, but we've made it. Um, there are also people, many thousands, I should imagine, who will be watching us from, from remotely, because this, this is being live streamed. Um, so wherever you are, whether you're in Edinburgh or, or somewhere else, uh, welcome to the first session of, of TAG Edinburgh 2022. So no, no pressure on anyone. Um, before we start, just a couple of minor things. Um, as we have, we've had, as is always the want with these things because of impact of, of travel arrangements, we've lost one speaker. So uh, unless Jiang Wang is here and hasn't told me, I don't think we're going to be having our second paper. So we're just going to move everything up and it will give all the presenters just a little bit of time, just a bit more breathing space just to just to talk. And unfortunately, my co-presenters, my co-organisers, uh, Abigail Moffat from the University of East Anglia and Shadrach Shrikuri from the University of Oxford, again, they've been beaten by, by, by travel arrangements, but I believe they are online. So hello, <laughs> if you are there. And, and they will be uh, hopefully presenting a recorded, a recorded lecture later on. Um, so, with those those caveats and mornings out the way, I think we'll I think we'll begin. Um, I'm a early medievalist. I work on the archaeology of what's generally the colder, wetter, windier parts of northwestern Europe. Um, but it's very and it's very easy to take on the mantle of of feeling that oneself is on the edge. Of, of of the broader the broader European world, I think a lot of us people who work on the, on on the north sometimes look towards the Mediterranean and the Red Sea and further afield with a a sense of um, perhaps jealousy, a sense that there might be a wider world out there, and a sense that we want to try and think about how our our particular fields of in, endeavours of inquiry might potentially engage with that wider world, um, and that's really the genesis for this for this session, it grows out of my desire to try and think about how my little patch of the world, in this case, an island, Lindisfarne, um, might key in to bigger questions, bigger debates, and does it have a story to tell or, or, or can it participate in a story that is more expansive than simply thinking about Northwestern, Northwestern Europe? Not so, I think we're all aware, in fact, probably one of the reasons why most of you are here, is it's clear that over the last five, ten years, there has been this um, global uh, turn to global medievalism. It's, it's, I've been to just a, a small number of, of, of the recent publications, uh, and these are purely the ones with nice covers, um, which are engaging with the global notion of global medieval, uh, or global middle ages. Uh, Beneath this is a, is a, there's a plethora of um, other journal articles, uh, seminars, lectures, conferences, and, and workshops. But what I've been finding is a lot of the discussion, a lot of the um, intellectual development of this notion has largely, not exclusively, but largely been driven by historians rather than archaeologists. And whilst I love historians, they love archaeologists, I'm sure. We are working within different but overlapping disciplines. And archaeology and archaeological approaches and archaeological sensibilities, I think, have the potential to deliver um, a particular nuanced approach to thinking about the local and the global. So as I said, what I'm going to do in this relatively short talk, these, these, these are short, punchy presentations, is just to try and think about how I might take this notion of the global and apply it to the work I do on an early medieval monastery on an island in the North Sea. Um, many of you will be familiar with Lindisfarne, some of you may not be. Uh, Lindisfarne is an early medieval monastery founded in the, in the mid-7th century. It's connected to the cult of St. Cuthbert. It's the location where the Lindisfarne Gospels were created. Many of you will be familiar with that, one of the great masterpieces of um, illuminated manuscript art art in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a Western European tradition, um, it's a very important site. I think I, I, I flatter myself, it's a very important site. But as I said, it's often seen through certain particular frames. Um, 
a lot when we work on early medieval Britain, we tend to often use this phrase insular Britain. And whilst it has very specific uh, connotations, technical and technical meanings referring to uh, uh, Britain and Ireland, it is a it is a word which is freighted with the notion of um, of a Britain that is somehow slightly isolated, slightly remote, slightly separate. Equally, this is a word we don't hear too much from archaeologists themselves, but certainly from the broader general public, the notion of the Celtic fringe with all the connotations of being on the edge of something, not really, not really participating, perhaps being a little bit isolated. So I want to just try and think about how we can combat some of those notions of, of insularity or smallness, smallness of scale, by thinking about Lindistan uh, in, 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 in a global context. And um, these are just a series of different framings, different ways one might try and approach this. First of all, I think this is where archaeologists have done the most kind of work with thinking about uh, global Middle Ages, the notion of material exchange and material acquisition. This is the uh, St Cuthbert's Cross from the Shrine of St Cuthbert, currently on display uh, in Durham Cathedral. It went into his into his burial in, in, the, in, the, mid seven, in the late late seventh, early eighth century. It's a classic example of golden garnet cloisonné work, uh, which we find a, a fair amount of in an early medieval British context. But when we when we can fragment it notionally, we can see garnet. That garnet is clearly not local. Uh, there's a lot of work going on uh, identifying garnet um, uh, sourcing at the moment. And we can think about, I mean, a lot of the garnet comes from uh, South Asia, from Sri Lanka. Uh, some of it also comes from Eastern Europe. Um, it's possible to, to tie this down increasingly using a range of materials analysis. So we can start to think about Lindisfarne as being part of a long distance network of supply. And if we roll this out to think about other elements of the, the shrine uh, of the shrine furniture of St. Cuthbert. We've got things like an elephant ivory liturgical comb. Is it Asian ele 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 elephant? Is it African elephant? We don't know. We've got silks. This is the so-called nature goddess silk, probably Byzantine, but there's a range of other silks associated with the shrine, some of which may be from further afield from places like Persia uh, and, and other areas in Central Asia. And this is all well and good. I think this helps us think about networks of exchange. It helps us think about how Britain, Northwestern Europe, is embedded within a larger meshwork of objects moving. I think one of the things about thinking about these big picture kind of uh, object exchange is it starts to problematize simple notions of core and periphery. So when, when, when we're looking at garnet moving from Sri Lanka to Northumbria, where is the core, where is the periphery? I think it reminds us that there are other ways and other mechanisms by which objects move. I do confess, though, to a slight anxiety when we start looking at this kind of material exchange. What often starts off with a detailed, well-minded consideration of broader supply patterns often gets reduced into an exercise in train spotting, trying to pick up the exotica, uh, and there's a series of examples which are always trotted out. The, uh, the Buddha uh, from uh, Helgo, uh, the, the, a, a series of objects from places like York, where we've got cowrie shells from the Indian Ocean, walrus ivory, Baltic amber, uh, uh, Samarkand dirhams, uh, silk from, from, from the East. The danger is we reduce the global medieval to just stamp collecting, trying to find examples of, of things which are unusual or exotic. Um, the real challenge is, is to start identifying points, mesh points in those networks, points where the tempus, the temporality of exchange increases, the intensity of exchange increases, but also thinking about points where they, the intensity of exchange then ebb away again. We can think about the roles of the institutions which perhaps move these objects. So the role of the church in some of those earlier objects. And then, of course, the Vikings, very important in stitching up new long distance exchange networks, which arguably go from, um, from Labrador into, into Central Asia. But also working on early medieval Christianity, I'm very interested in these long distance ideological connections. And this is, an, this is a case where we can think about notions of global medieval to decenter 
what we what we understand and what we think about. This is a, a, a Eusebian canon table from the Lindisfarne Gospels. It's basically a kind of finding aid to help people find their way around the gospel books. Uh, it, it, it synchronizes the different stories uh, within within the gospel book. But that's lovely. But we find exactly the same kind of tables on the left in the in the Syriac Rabula Gospels produced somewhere in North Syria in the late sixth century. On the right, we've got Garima Gospel One. Uh, dated kind of mid mid seventh century, sixth to seventh century from Ethiopia. So one of the key things for me to think about is that Christianity is part of a of a world that goes far beyond the confines of Europe. And I'm increasingly interested in thinking about how we can analyse big large-scale institutional affiliations over very long distances. These are just a selection of examples of world Christianity. The recently, um, in the latest antiquity, a um, uh, uh, church from Eritrea of, from the 6th century. We've got uh, uh, St. Thomas crosses from southern India, 10th century. We've got Nestorian crosses from Xinjiang in China. It's really important that we remember that Christianity does not equate simply to Europe. And equally, when we look at practices in paganism in the Baltic and in the, and, and in the sub-Poland North, that Europe doesn't automatically equate to Christianity. We can also think about the impact of Islam in the South. It, I found it impossible, preparing this, to find a map that showed the distribution of Christianity in the late first millennium AD. I can find maps which showed maps of Christian Europe, maps of Christian East, maps of Christian Africa. There is nowhere can one turn to actually find basic framings which just show everything synchronized in one particular period across a truly global scale, which I think speaks volumes about how this is being approached. We could also take a more comparative approach to Christianity. I'm not gonna, this is, don't worry, Chris, I've only got one slide on comparative. Um, so a, we could think about how the monastery as a structure in principle works in early medieval, the early medieval Christian world. Uh, again, recently published a couple of about months or so ago, the new, the new monastic site from uh, Falaka Island in Kuwait. Uh, we've got uh, Ethiopian Christianity, Debridano, there on the right. We can think about do we see similarities, equally do we see differences in the way in which monasticism operates. Equally, we can draw the scale out a little bit further and maybe think about how can we understand global monasticism on a, on a, on a broader scale. Can we, can we see similarities between Tibetan Buddhist monasteries, between, and it doesn't have to be monasticism, but broader religious institutions. And I think Owen Goffman's formulation of a notion of a total institution is quite useful here. because It allows us to start thinking about comparisons between Islamic madrasas, between uh, Jewish yeshivas, um, between monastic sites like this. It offers us an opportunity to start thinking thinking comparatively. But of course, a lot of this kind of monasticism extends well before Christianity, and that starts problematizing the, no, the medieval element of the global, the global Middle Ages. Which leads us nicely on to thinking about what do we mean by the medieval? Because the danger is, is we are, can be seen as scholars working in a Northwest European tradition, trying to cram the world of archeology, span the archeology span of South India, the archeology span of Eastern China, into a framework which is based on our relatively small part of the world. We need to start thinking about, can we apply medieval unproblematically as a simple chronological framework? Or, and there's an argument for this, can we see medieval as a, an e social evolutionary stage. So, for example, people, some people working on India have been talking about the Indian, the Indian medi medieval period, and other scholars have, have done similar things for other areas. Often that keys into notions of social evolution, which perhaps a lot of people may not feel particularly comfortable with uh, at the moment, but it does start to raise the question, are there certain broad social processes, such as the alienation of land and gifting it to monastic institutions, the, uh, the afterlife of empires that might produce common themes that can be seen through a series of different case studies on a global scale. So we're thinking about the past as an analogy. Also, I think 
this notion of the hyper object. Some of you who are into your flat ontologies and actor network theory may have encountered this. The notion of some phenomena which are so large that they can't be encompassed and they are experienced on a range of scales. They are too big to draw a line around and there's something which impacts on lots of people. And a great example of this are things like climate. And here we might think about another way in which we can articulate different places uh, within, perhaps, say, broadly, the, the late first millennium AD, how they experience, how they tackle big picture issues, such as global changes in, in China. On the left, we've got uh, an early medieval site, Gringshiel at Lindisfarne, which has been engulfed by sand dunes caused by the Little Ice Ages, yet there are people doing archaeological work looking at the impact of Little Ice Age in places like Central America. So are, can we bring a comparative perspective onto responses to climactic change. Another of these big hyper objects, uh, there's a great article by Peter Campbell uh, looking at this recently, are things like oceans and the sea. And when we are looking at the Northern, Brit Northern Britain, the Atlantic, the same Atlantic Ocean that laps up against the edges of St Kilda and the Western Isles is the same Atlantic Ocean which edges up against Baffin Island, uh, Labrador, and of course you know, most, most of the east coast of the United States. So in this situation, we have quite literally different communities, two different, two different parts of the world, literally fishing in the same waters, exploiting the same uh, fish stocks, exploiting the same whale stocks. On the left here, we've got whale bone from our excavations on Lindisfarne uh, and what it looks like when it's polished up a bit and made a bit nicer. Equally, we know that, that Proto-Inuit, the Thule culture, are equally using whale bone, potentially from the same whale, whale stocks, in a whole series of, of, of their own strategies. And one might start to question, what impact does Inuit or early medieval engagement with those whale stocks are they felt? Do they actually have a bigger, uh, a, a longer term impact? And here, of course, we start getting into notions such as, such as the Anthropocene. And finally, I think most importantly, we need to think about global medieval as a, as a political stance. And this is something which is implicit in a lot of the writing, but not always drawn out. Thinking about a global medieval framing does two things. It decenters us working in Northwestern Europe, where for a whole series of social contexts, historical contexts, we have tended to view the past, the global past, through a Northwest European lens. It does us good to remember that in the, in, in, in the mid first millennium AD, there are more Christians outside Europe than there are inside Europe, for example. It helps us think about relative importance. Also, there's a political stance of opening up and listening to new researchers, listening to communities, who may not have a voice, scholars who may not have access to research networks, research resources. And I think there's no point doing any of the other things with the global, med middle age, med global medieval world unless we open ourselves up to talking to the people who actually know far more about a lot of this stuff than we perhaps do. So to wrap up very quickly, for me, one of the criticisms I've heard about global Middle Ages is that people don't know what it is. I've heard of, of um, workshops which have kind of floundered because there is no agreed understanding of what the global Middle Ages actually was. Yet for me, I think that very inchoate, ill-defined nature of the global Middle Ages is actually one of its strengths. I think we lose something if we start trying to pare it down to very tightly agreed definition. But for me, there are three, those three broad approaches. Thinking about decentering our research areas, but also decentering what we do as modern scholars, those of us working in, 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 in the Northwestern European tradition. Thinking about tracing connections, and that might be tracing connections in terms of objects or ideology or um, social practices, which leads us finally onto the notion of making analogies. I think archaeologists, I think, for a lot for, due to long-term disciplinary development, I think we're much more confident and, and, and used to thinking about looking at other societies as analogies to the societies we're studying, our, our, own, our own 
focus of societies. I think we're much more happy, happy with that than the often very particularist approaches adopted by historians. I know there's probably lots of historians online going, no, we're not particularists at all. Um, but I, I think we have a disciplinary comfort with thinking about analogy, thinking about comparison, that many historians don't. But of course, once you start thinking about analogy, then that starts breaking down the temporal framework. If do we need, if we can think globally, but do we need to think about the global Middle Ages? So I think there's some really interesting questions there about problematizing what we mean by the medieval, problematizing the value of keeping a tight medieval framework rather than a truly global framework. But also we need to problematize what we mean by global as well. Vast majority of work done on global Middle Ages is really working on Afro-Eurasia. Very, very little engagement with thinking about the new world and how those connections might actually tie up. We tend to have our global, Medi our global Middle Ages is often surprisingly parochial with huge chunks of the world not engaged in, in its framing analysis. Okay, I'm going to leave it there. Um, hopefully a lot of these ideas will come up over the, over the course of this afternoon. Um, I'm positive about the value of global Middle Ages. It's something which needs to be taken carefully and thoughtfully and constructively. Uh, but I think it does bring value to what we're going, what we're doing. And I think this afternoon's session is going to emphasize that. So with no more ado, I'm going to hand over to my co colleague from, from Durham. So we're global Middle Ages, but we've got two Durham scholars in a row. So I'm not sure what that says about the about the <laughs> about the invisible college of medieval archaeologists. So I'm going to hand over to Chris Davis, who's talking about Buddhist and Christian monasticism within the global.